What's up, my people? I told you guys I'd be live tonight. So, I, yeah. Okay. I think I want to take my makeup off, but I don't know, because I'm looking kind of cute right now. So, we're going to wait until some people come in here to hang out with us. <laughs> I'm just you waiting. What? <laughs> I was saying, we're going to wait until some people come in here to hang out with us. What is that? Um, I just got done eating a sub, y'all, and I had lettuce on my tooth. Ugh, gross. Okay. We went to uh, Jersey Mike's, or whatever it's called, um, and it was really good. They are like more of like a, you know, Eastern style sub sandwich with like um, vinegar and... Um, Olive oil and salt and pepper, that kind of thing. Provolone cheese instead of like white American. So it was good. It was good. I liked it. So what's going on? I had a couple of people that were messaging me in my DMs today asking if I was going to go live. And so, of course, I'm going to go live. I usually go live at least once a day. Hadn't gone live at all today. Um, so here I am. Um trying to think of what I want to do because I don't want to sit I, I'm I don't have my freaking tripod no more you guys I broke it like a dumb motherfucker and so now I'm struggling oh well hey Tyler hell no I ain't cooking Tanya <laughs> no we're going to my mother-in-law's house now so like, the the way we do things uh, for holidays in my family is we go over to my mother-in-law's house for Thanksgiving, and we go over to my mom and dad's house for Christmas. Hey, Rhonda. And so, my mom has always cooked thanks, uh, Christmas dinner, or always cooked, you know? And so, now, that doesn't mean that I can't do it, though. When my mama, hey, Allie, when my mama moved to New York, because whenever me and my... Um, Whenever I got really bad off in my addiction, me and my sister Michelle, because we were both dr drug addicts, um, my parents, like, were going to have a mental breakdown. And so, my dad was, like, legit about to have a heart attack. And so, he's like, I got to get the fuck up out of Dodge. And so, they left Arkansas, and they moved to New York for, like, three or four years to get away from the stress of of having two drug addicted daughters, you know, now my baby sister, Christine is like the angel of the family, the one with a halo over her head. She didn't become addicted to drugs. Um, she just became a lesbian. So <laughs> just like, <laughs> no, she really is a lesbian though. But, um, when we were, when me and my sister got to using drugs it, at first, it wasn't that bad, you know, cause we were younger. But once we got to be older and we just got out of line, you know, like I, we were injecting, we were using together. Um, my sister's son got taken away from her by her husband. And see, my mom and my dad had stayed in Arkansas for so long because they were taking care of my sister's son. Because my sister is bipolar, manic, depressive. And she just really struggles with her mental health. And so my mom and dad had always kind of like helped her. Hey, Daniel, uh, take care of her little boy. Now, they ain't never done nothing like that for me um, before. So I could say I don't want to take care of my son anymore. And they'd be like, oh, well, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, whenever you have, uh, whatever you have, siblings that have different kinds of needs you know the parents do different things for different siblings so because my sister struggled with mental health a lot worse than i did my parents helped her hey cynthia helped her a lot more um with things than they helped me with you know um and that's fine like my sister needed the extra help i'm not jealous at all because i could Whenever I was in my active addiction, I could fend for myself. You know what I mean? Um, my sister really struggled a lot. So, and she had a kid. So, that made it a lot. Look at him. He's sneaking. Uh, he's, my look. Nate, did you sneak some whipped cream? Yes. Yeah, you. <laughs> so, I had to get my bottle of water. Yeah, it is hard. 
and my sister Michelle, because her bipolar is like, uh, it's really, a, it's not, man it's managed well now today in her, in, in right now, but back then whenever she was younger, um, it wasn't managed as well, but now she's on medications that, um, that actually manage her bipolar quite well now. No, I'm the oldest. My sister Michelle is the middle, and then my baby sister Christine is is the baby. Mentioned a little of your story, but reminds me so much of mine. So I'm listening. Hey Holly, what's up, girl? Nice to meet you. Hey Ralph, what's up? So Ashley, I probably haven't. So whenever I have to go and look for y'all's, so I have to look for you guys' messages, okay? Um, if you don't follow me or you're not, if you're not friends with me, okay, you can follow me, but if you're not friends with me, um, your messages go into a spam folder. So every night before I go to bed, I go in to said spam folder and I pull all these messages. I'll show y'all real fast. Okay. And it's a lot, you guys. It's not like, it's not like, oh, just one or two people message in there okay it's like a lot so i spend a good portion of two hours answering messages back i'll show y'all real quick so okay so um but yeah i'll i will answer you back though um i'm very um i'm really good about that Hey, that's your mom. Uh, Rhonda's your mom. Holly, I love your mom. She's so fucking cool, dude. We could just really hit it off. <laughs> you know, um, I try to, I listen to y'all. I try really, really hard to, um, get back, uh, in a timely fashion, fashion to everybody. But I wanted to show y'all something, okay? Cause I, I don't want y'all to ever think that I'm not answering y'all's messages. Oh, thank you, Holly. So, okay. Here is, here's where I have to go. So this is my regular messenger. As you can see, Holly just messaged me and Allie messaged me, but everybody else has been answered, okay? So I have to go into this special little button right here and then I have to go here to message requests and then it says you may know and then it says spam. And so I have to sit here and wait for it to like auto generate all the spam messages. And so what will happen is what goes to spam is like all these sex things that people keep. Oh, is that you, Ashley, right there? Ashley Green? Um, see all these like these are all sex things, local hookup, da, 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 right? And then there's one person who's actually reaching out for help, right? So I have to go through all of those to find um, y'all, y'all's names in there. So please don't think that I'm like ignoring you. It just takes a, a little bit of time to go through all that, to go all that through, through all that bullshit. You know, it would be different if it was a bunch of people reaching out for help. But it's all like these weird sex sites. It's it's really annoying, dude. <laughs> so, um, but since I'm on here, I guess I'll go through these. So, what do you guys? What are y'all wanting to? What do y'all want to talk about tonight? Uh, um, Aaron says she wants to take a minute and thank everyone that responded to her prayer request for her son. You all are amazing. So. Thank, I wanted to say something, too. I mean, I did make a post about it, but I wanted to tell you guys, thank you so much to everybody that commented on that video because, or on that um, post. That was so freaking badass, man. Like, I was crying because I saw all the people that were in the comment section, like, telling um, Aaron that they were praying for her and all this stuff. Like, it got me really fucking emotional, man. Um, really emotional. And I just... Uh, whenever I started my YouTube channel two, five, five years ago, I always, my goal was to have a community of people that were like, that were all inclusive, that supported all recovery, and that were like, like, like this, like that were kind and loving and tolerant and understanding. Let me shut this fucking laptop or else I'll just look at that the whole time. And, um, and that were, you know, that were just, because here's the thing, like on social media, you guys, a lot of the times people can just be mean for no reason. Okay. Like just out of nowhere, 
You know, I'll get a comment that says like, you're a, you're, you're, you're a crooked teeth, fat ass bitch. And I don't even know who the people are. You know what I mean? And so, uh, whenever I see all, everybody like coming together and helping each other, it makes me like really, really happy. Cause that was my whole point in building my social media was to have a community of people that were supportive of people that were on medication assisted treatment. Because whenever I started um, sharing about being on Suboxone, I got made fun of really bad and I got shunned from a lot of groups. And this was in 2016, you know, it was a long time ago. And, and years ago, it was not like acceptable to be on medication assisted treatment. And um, when I started my YouTube channel, I was trying to find people that were like me who were on MAT, who supported all paths to recovery, who just want to be there to support people, you know? I've been trying to, hold on, let me read your comment. Wean off of Suboxone for four months now and while trying to treat my ADHD and anxiety. It's hard to find doctors to do everything for recovery. <laughs> he doesn't recognize you for recovering addicts. Oh, listen to me, honey. Because because I'm on Suboxone, I can't find a doctor to treat my ADHD. Because I'm on Suboxone, I can't find a doctor to help me with my weight. Because I'm on Suboxone, like, it's crazy, dude. Because I'm on Wellbutrin, I can't take this medication. And so, but a lot of the reasons why doctors won't help me is because I have a past history of addiction. Even though I've been off of all illicit substances for over seven, over seven years, seven and a half years, almost eight years now. And um, it would be different if I was like struggling and I was like relapsing every other day. Um, thanks, Ralph. I appreciate you. Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> um, it would be different if I was like using substances and I wasn't taking care of my son. Um, and, and that's the struggle that I have come up against in recovery is that. Now that I'm in recovery and I'm utilizing MAT treatment as it's prescribed to me, I, I still get ju judged like I'm on drugs, um, illicit substances, you know, and it makes it really, really hard because I don't know if, if you come to my lives, you'll know what I'm talking about. I struggle so bad to like stay. Um, you'll just see it. You'll see. Just stay for a while. I try to stay on t course when I'm making these videos. When I'm live, it's impossible for me to stay on one topic for very long because of the comments, because of my own mind. I just can't do it. So we go wild over here. It's like a party every live stream. <laughs> you know? I had a question that I posted about. Hey, Gabriel, will you comment it uh, now that I see your comments? So will you comment it one more time, please? Um, yeah, there's a lot of, and listen, here's the thing, you guys, like, I have no problem with people not, like, I have no problem if you're like, oh, Matt treatment didn't work for me, or, you know, I don't like Matt, I don't like Matt treatment, right, I have no problem with that, the problem that I have is, like, when people have to come and put their opinion so out when I'm over here sharing about my my recovery and my my accomplishments and I'm feeling good and I'm happy and I'm confident and I'm being like, yeah, I made it to seven and a half years. Yeah, I made it to five months, two months, three months. And then you got Joe Blow over here that comments and says, you're not really sober because you're on Suboxone. Like, that yeah. shit drives me insane, dude. Don't like, dude, are you that fucking pressed that I'm taking subs that you got to come comment on my shit? You know what I mean? Like, does it bother you that much that I'm on subs claiming sobriety? Like, come on, man. If it bothers you that much, you got something wrong with you. You know, and that's why, that's why I started posting reels here on Facebook because, um, I love, I love popping off on, on these reels to some of these people because it's like, it's okay for you to think that in your closed minded, small little brain, but it's not okay for you to come and comment it on my platform. Go, pla go make your own platform all about it. You know what I mean? Go make your pla own platform all about it here. That's not what we're about here. We're about helping each other and encouraging each other and building each other up and helping each other stay on the right path, no matter what that path 
is leading to, right? Whatever your recovery looks like to you is what it looks like to you and my recovery looks like to me. I don't need you to come over and, jerk and, and, and guard my recovery or tell me how to do it, you know? Effects of meth abuse, referring to the noticeable things about us that others can see that cause us shame and social anxiety for talking. <laughs> Gabriel, okay. So I'll, I'll tell you a story, okay, Gabriel? And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody buckle up. So Gabriel wants me to talk about the long-term effects of meth addiction. And so I want to share something with you, okay, Gabriel? And I hope it helps you feel a little bit better. So I was on meth from the time I was 17 years old till the time I was 31 and a half, 32 years old. And, um, and I was shot out. Okay, every time I shot meth, I would go into straight up hallucinations, psychosis right away. Okay, I was accusing my husband of getting head in the bed. At the, I'm laying beside him and I'm seeing an imaginary woman underneath the, underneath the covers in between his legs. You know, like crazy shit. And so, and, 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 and outlandish crazy shit that you would think that, how could she even think that was really happening, you know? And every time, especially towards the end of my addiction, every time I did meth, I was off, off to the races bonkers. So whenever I got sober from methamphetamine, I, I had gotten really used to, um, to communicating with people fucked up and high, you know? Like I was, I felt confident whenever I was fucked up and high. Well, when I got sober, I noticed, or I didn't notice it. My husband pointed it out to me in early recovery. And this, I remember it hurt my feelings because I, I noticed it after he pointed it out. But when I first got sober, I used to talk like this out of the side of my mouth like that. And my mouth would go to the side like that. And I had no idea that it was happening at all. Like I, 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 I was none the wiser, you know. And then when we got sober, my husband started to point it out to me that, hey, you know, when you talk, your mouth goes to the left. And I would get in the mirror and I would watch myself and try to make it stop, right? I think it was just like nerve damage, right? Um, from our, because when we we're shooting methamphetamine, it affects our central nervous system. And I think from all those years from shooting meth, it just was fucking my central nervous system up. And so I couldn't correct it on my own. It had to like go away on its own. It had to like run its course, you know? Um, and so I remember being so embarrassed and so ashamed and so awkward to talk to anybody. And the, the major long-term effect of meth that I struggle with still to this day is the not having any kind of pleasure in my life. And the only way that I can experience pleasure is by like, it has to be something that's like induced. You know what I mean? Like I have to like really, um, how do I explain this? Like I have to be like, okay. So like, let's say having sex with my husband or something like that. Like I have to really work at it to be able to have like pleasure in, in that area because like my brain for some reason just doesn't fire off like dopamine at all anymore. And I thought that I was, I thought I was tripping, you know, I was like, Oh, Nicole, it'll get better. You've been sober. This was when I was first got sober. Oh, you've over been only been sober for one year, two years, right? Bitch. It's been seven and a half years. Okay. And I still, still feel like I'm, I'm monotone like this. Nah. You know what I mean? And it's like, does this ever change? And so I started like really looking into like what meth does to your brain whenever you take methamphetamine. And that's when I found two different doctors who were talking about how methamphetamine, when you use it, it releases a thousand times more dopamine than any drug that you could use. Heroin, fentanyl, cocaine, crack, methamphetamine. Um, releases the most dopamine, okay? And so what I believe has happened to me over the 15 years of fucking meth addiction is that I my fucking brain is depleted and it's probably like spitting out like one dopamine per day. Like an old car breaking down on the side of the road or some shit like that. You know what I mean? And so like I have to take, well, I take Wellbutrin. 
I take Lexapro. I'm on a quarter milligram of Suboxone. Like I take all these medications to try and just like muster up some kind of fucking dopamine uh, uh, production in my brain, you know? And it's hard because I feel like I'm like I'm never ever going to be able to feel like like true fucking um, pleasure. Okay, I I know there's people out there who know what I'm talking about. You know, I know y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. And then people I feel like think that I am. I feel like people think I'm over exaggerating. Right. I am not over exaggerating. Okay, like it's. I, I have fun when I'm on here with you guys, but I'm also I, I, I'm also a really polished. I have practiced. Okay, I have been making videos for over five years. I know how to talk in front of a camera and keep people engaged and entertained. Do you know what I'm saying? And so this isn't a good gauge of how I'm really feeling because that's what people will say. They'll say, "Well, you have so much energy on your lives," and da 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 da. And I'm like. Talking doesn't take energy to me. It doesn't. Okay. <laughs> um, talking that isn't something I have to like do to make myself have energy. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so that's why it just comes natural to me. It just comes natural to me. And so I just want you guys to know that like, if you're feeling discouraged uh, that I want you to know that I have, I struggle too. And I pray every day that, you know, as I lose weight and get in shape, because I do believe that diet and exercise, you know, will help me to feel better. Okay. Now, that's one huge mistake that I made when I got sober. One huge mistake I made when I got sober was I was so hyper-focused on staying away from drugs that I totally negated my, my physical health. Okay? Thank you, Steven. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Lacey. <laughs> Thank you, Lacey. I totally, like... Uh, ignored my, my physical health. And I was literally like, well, you know, I was also fucking starving, dude. You know, I was so skinny whenever I was in active addiction, you guys, like I was skinny as fuck. Okay. And I had, my hair was falling out. I looked like a skeleton, you know, like Skeletor. And so when I got sober, I was hungry like a motherfucker, you know? And so I was eating and eating and eating and eating and just like piling all this uh, food into my um, pie hole, you know? And as I did that, I, I didn't realize that I was developing an eating disorder called binge eating disorder. And so one day, I it was like one day, four years later, I woke up, right? And I was so fucking fat. And I was like, what the hell? How did this happen? You know what I mean? Like, it was like it just happened overnight. And um, I remember my friend Andrew, he was going on this show with the Tamron Hall show. And I had never even thought about having a binge eating disorder. And he reached out to me and he's like, hey, I want you to go on the Tamron Hall show with me because they're talking about cross addiction. And I want you to talk about your food cross addiction. And I was like, well, gee, thanks, motherfucker. I didn't know. I didn't um, really realize it, but I guess I do have one, <laughs> you know. And so that's when I found out and realized how badly I had become cross addicted to food and how badly I had become a binge eater. And I was eating in the middle of the night. I mean, like 12 midnight, two o'clock in the morning, waking up with like crumbs in my bed because I've done eight. Like one night I remember in particular. I had my, um, I love fucking bagels. Okay. I love bagels and cream cheese. And I had eaten four whole bagels, not just one side of the bagel, the bagel, four of them. That's eight pieces. Okay. Eight pieces, two, four, six, eight. And I went to sleep on a cream cheese ass eight bagel stomach. And that shit was the worst, you know, and I would wake up and I would be in pain and I would be agonizing pain when I, I, I would have to shit and it would fucking hurt so bad. And it was because of that. When I got sober, I got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and I was going to therapy. OK, I was going to um, therapy like 
every, bi-weekly therapy, and I was going to Alcoholics Anonymous three times a week, motherfuckers, and working the 12 steps of the sponsor. And so I was doing everything that I was supposed to be doing. Like, I was doing the damn thing, you know, but... I got addicted to food and, and, and I was spending so much time on st- making sure I stayed away from drugs. I mean, if y'all could have seen it, if y'all could have been a fly on the wall, okay, and been there with me because I was so hyper focused on staying away from drugs, not relapsing on drugs, not um, picking up all that stuff, that whenever food got involved, I was just like, I didn't even think about food being a bad thing or being a negative, you know, and this happens to a lot of people who um, get sober from drugs and alcohol, any drugs, any drugs. And so I hope that by me sharing that with you guys, it's embarrassing for me to share that. Like, I'm ashamed that I I gained so much weight, you know, Um, that was what started my drug addiction in the first place was my weight because I felt so um ashamed of all the weight that I had gained when I was younger. I had like a problem with my weight. Sorry, I think we're missing. Uh, I had a problem with my weight when I was younger and um, not really bad. Like I wasn't obese when I was younger. I was probably like 10 or 15 pounds overweight, right? But when you're younger you can't see what you see when you get older. And I was beautiful when I was younger. There was nothing wrong with me. But to me, I was fat and I was ugly and I was brown and I had dark hair. And all my friends were like tall and skinny and blonde hair and blue eyes and green eyes. And I was this short, brown, lump of shit is what I thought I was like. A big fucking pile of shit, you know? And so... I had talked my mom into taking me to our family doctor, and so she did, and I talked my family doctor, this is years ago, I was like 16, into prescribing me Phentermine to lose weight. And when he did that, it helped me lose weight, and I was so happy because I lost the weight, like a little 20 pounds, and I was so happy. But it also helped me to be able to, like, pay attention in class better. It helped me to be able to get my homework assignments done. And, like, it overall just made my life better, I felt like, right? And so after that, I was, like, seeking out stimulants at a young age when I was 17. And so it, this all, my whole addiction started from me being overweight and, and taking stimulants to lose weight. And then liking that stimulants helped me and wanting to, you know, have the results that I had and then seeking them out, you know? I can relate. Hey, thank you, Tracy. I appreciate you, girl. I understand. I'm a motherfucking cusser. I can't help it, girl. Um, diet pills. I got them too for years. I have always been big. And thank you, Crystal. Thank you. I really appreciate that, girl. Thank you so much for the stars. Um, and I wish, and I'm going to tell y'all something right now since Tracy brought it up. I cuss like a fucking sailor, y'all. And I've tried my hardest not to cuss, but you know what? When I cuss, it don't fucking sound right. When I don't cuss, it don't fucking sound right. It don't, it doesn't, it's not me, you know? And so I'm not going to be somebody that I'm not. You know, I'm not going to act like some prim and proper uh, person and be like, that's stupid. Um, I cuss, you know, and so I understand if you can't watch me because I cuss because I just do, (laughs) you know. But anyway, um, I wish that I I think that when I look back on my childhood as a young kid, I think that, um, you know, this is what I'm trying to work with my son. Okay. Hey, um, Tennessee, you guys can get, let me put it in the comment section, okay? So there is a medication-assisted treatment program that I actually um, work with. They're called Recovery Delivered, and my friend Marcus uh, created the company. It's an online telehealth uh, mat treatment program. And what they do is if you come in there and you say, hey, Nicole sent me, 
they're going to give you 50% off your first appointment. So if you're somebody who is like, hey, Nicole, I can't get on Matt because I can't afford the $200 appointment at my doctor's office. Um, there is a link right there, and they're good in all 50 states. And they also have their own pharmacy, so they can ship your medication to you, too. So anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Now that I'm an adult and I see like how my dad talking about his weight affected me, now that I'm an adult, I try, I'm trying to do better with my son and not make him obsessed with his weight like I became obsessed with my weight from seeing my dad worrying about his weight. So your medication will be covered on your insurance, you guys, but the recovery delivered place doesn't take insurance yet. So the price of your appointment is $49, and then after that, it's $89 a month. So, but, but they don't take insurance. Just your medicine will be uh, covered, just not, not the visit. Um, and, you know, here's the thing. This is what I think. Do you guys watch Gary Vee? Okay, he's like a huge entrepreneur, right? Huge, badass motherfucker in social media, right? He said something to me. It's great. Jennifer, it's, it's wonderful. And I had Marcus on here, and he talked all about it. So if you guys want to go find that live, it's on my YouTube channel. Just look up Recovery Delivered and Nicole. But I was watching one of his uh, videos online, and he was talking about how his son's teacher called him because his son said a cuss word in school. And he said something, and it was great. I loved it. He said, so? Does he make good grades? And the teacher said, yeah, he makes straight A's. And he said, has he ever missed a, a day? And she said, no, his attendance is perfect. And he was like, "Is was he cussing at you? And she said, no. And he was like, well, then what does it matter? You know, like, to me, cussing is like putting salt and pepper on your food, baby. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I feel the same way. So, but I, I mean, I don't like try to make people cuss or something. Like if you don't want to cuss, that's on you, but I cuss. Um, does the Matt online program only do Suboxone, Subutex, not methadone? Yeah. So no, there's no clinics that will do telehealth methadone. And I'm not really sure why. I need to find out. I don't know if it's because they like want to monitor it more closely because um, a lot of the times they're giving you the liquid, you know. Now, if it was a, here's the thing. My husband, back 10 years ago, you guys, 10 years ago, you used to be able to go to the doctor and get pills of methadone prescribed to you, right? And so I don't see why they wouldn't do it like that through telehealth, you know? But I have tried and I have looked everywhere and there's no telehealth for methadone. It's only for buprenorphine, suboxone. Hey, Eileen. So, okay, now that I done t told y'all about my fatness, <laughs> that's, that is one of the, the hardest things that I have struggled with in my recovery since getting sober is, is overeating and, and, um, binge eating. And I, I honestly, I haven't had any issues like really wanting to go out and relapse. Like I haven't, I've only had one close call and I'll tell you what happened. Okay. When I first got on Suboxone, okay. I was um, still doing my addict behaviors, okay? And I was taking one of my Suboxones a month, maybe two, and I was selling them to my friend because she couldn't get her own prescription and she wanted to get on subs, but she couldn't afford it. So I was selling her one or two of my subs every month, right? And that's not good. You shouldn't be doing that. It'll take you down the wrong path. And I'm fixing to share with you guys how it did to me. So she had came over to my house one night and, and I was giving her, you know, her sub. Well, she actually had some Xanaxes in her wallet, some blue footballs, right? And yes, yes, Teresa, that's what it's made for. Uh, people that are coming off opioids. Um, she had some blue footballs in her wallet and I was like, oh, my weakness, Xanax. So I said, get me some of them motherfuckers, you know, like four of them. And so she gave me four of them and I had devised a plan. I will take them at night when my husband is asleep and he'll never know, you know? And so 
that's what I was going to do. Well, that afternoon, my husband came home, and I don't know what was going on. I think I wanted him to go get me candy from the gas station or something. And he was like, do you got any cash? And so I was like, yeah, there's $20 in my wallet. And he grabbed my wallet and opened it, and there was them four footballs staring him right there in the face. He caught me red-handed with these damn Xanax footballs, and he flushed them down the toilet. That was the only close call that I've ever had to relapsing. And when I think back to it, it was because I was doing, I was doing behaviors that I would do in active addiction, you know. And so that's why I don't sell my medication, you know. I don't give my medication to anybody anymore. I don't even hang out with anybody that would even ask me for my medication. Do you know what I'm saying? But like at when I first got on medication assisted treatment. I mean, that was something that I struggled with. That was, that was something that was very, you know, normal for me at first. And so, um, also like overtaking my medication was something that was normal for me because I thought, oh, well, if I overtake it, um, I will feel better, right? Well, that's not quite how it works with Suboxone. And I didn't know that because I had never been on subs before. I got to plug my phone in. And so, um. I figured all this out, you know, by trial and error, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm honest about all those things, not because I'm proud of it at all. Okay. But I'm honest about that because I know a lot of people that are going to have the same experiences and might struggle with that too. Hold on. You guys. I got to get my water bottle because I had to plug my phone in. Okay. I know a lot of people who, um, might struggle with that also like I did, you know, and so don't do that, okay? Don't do what I did, but just know that if you have and you're trying to change, that you can and you don't have to continue doing those behaviors. Another behavior that I struggled with in early sobriety was shoplifting, okay? I was the shoplifting queen of America, all right? Like for some reason, <clears throat> my throat is like really fucked up. I used to take Xanax and then I would shoplift. everything in sight. Okay. And, um, I, like I told you guys, my parents kicked me out and I was unable to move back in with them. So I had to learn to like fend for myself and hustle from the time I started using drugs, you know? And so there was times where I would use all my paycheck and I would have no money, you know, to buy my drugs. So what I would do is I devised a plan of a way for me to go into this big shopping center, Dillard's, and shoplift all these luxury purses and then sell them to my dope dealers, old ladies, you know, for like $100 a purse, $200 a purse, $150, whatever. And so I did that and I followed through and I, and it worked like four or five times, right? And, you know, once you've done it like two, three times and then you get away with it like four or five times, you're skinning up, you're getting away with it by the skin of your teeth, you know? Well, I had kept doing it thinking, you know, they're never going to catch me. <laughs> well, they finally caught me. And when I tell you guys that cost me over a thousand, it was like two, three thousand dollar ticket that I had to pay. I had to go to, sh not, I had to go to don't shoplift classes. I don't even remember what they were teaching us, but like it was pretty self-explanatory that we don't need to be shoplifting, you know? But when I got sober, I had to learn how to not shoplift anymore. Okay. Because I had gotten used to it. It was a working part of my mind. So my husband was working at Kroger as a manager and I'm walking into the Kroger and stealing lip gloss and, and eyeshadow out of the makeup department. And I remember calling my sponsor and I'm like, Jean, I just shoplifted a whole fucking face of makeup from Kroger. <laughs> you know, and she's like, Nicole, you, that's old behavior. You're going to relapse if you don't stop. Like you really need to get that under control. And, you know, she wasn't going to shame me or anything, but she was telling me how serious it was. What if I got caught? Um, what if my son started doing it? And lo and behold, yeah. my little boy, we took him on a trip to Branson and we went to walk out of the store and he grabs a knife off of the display and says, look, mom, look what I stole. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. But I had, I had been doing it, you know? 
And so I had to retrain my brain to, to stop shoplifting. It was, a, it was one of the hardest addictions I've tried, I've had to, to beat was shoplifting. Um, because the reward of it was so great, you know, like having all this products or money that you could get for the stuff. It was like a, it was a good, uh, a risk and a reward. The reward was high, you know? And so, uh, it was a really hard time for me to break that, but I did, you know, I did each time I would go into the store. If I knew that, you know, I would, if I knew that the store that I was going in, that I would go down the makeup aisle or whatever aisle it was that was tempting to me to shoplift, I wouldn't go down it. I would not go down those aisles. I would stay completely away from those aisles. I would tell somebody that I was with, right? Hey, don't let me go down this aisle because I will steal the fuck out of that aisle. I will clean that motherfucker up. <laughs> And that's how I stopped shoplifting. You know, a lot of the things that I've done, um, I've been able to stop doing on my own, like smoking cigarettes. Um, my little boy, that was one of my struggles when I got sober was I was smoking cigarettes. And um, I didn't want to smoke cigarettes because I didn't want my little boy to see me smoking cigarettes. Well, one day he came outside and he picked a cigarette butt off the ground. And he was like two and a half. And he put it up to his lips and he said, Look, Mama, I'm smoking. And I mean, I lost my shit. I started crying, and I got all the cigarettes and all the ashtrays, and I threw them all away. Because nobody else smokes in our family, you know? Oh, no, Rhonda, no. He wasn't un um, old enough to understand. But when he went and stole that knife and then said that he stole it, it was just such a crazy situation because it was just like... <laughs> Did he know? No, he didn't know. Um, he was just a baby. But, um, um, what was I saying? I, can't, I forgot. Oh, yeah, him smoking the cigarette. But he did know about me smoking cigarettes, okay? And he was smoking, he was acting like he was smoking a cigarette because he knew what, he was putting it to his mouth and everything. And I freaked out and I felt so horrible. Because you got to understand, like, when it comes to my son, I have a lot of guilt and shame because of my addiction while I was pregnant. And I, that, sh and that's right, rightfully so. I should feel that shame and guilt, right? I should have that. Okay. If I didn't have guilt and shame, then I would be an alien because, or I would be a sick motherfucker because, um, using drugs while you're pregnant, you know, is not a good thing. So, um, when he had that little cigarette to his mouth, I got so upset because I knew that it was because of me, you know, it was because of him seeing me have cigarettes in my mouth. Sorry, guys, I put this on. And so when I saw him doing that, I knew it was directly because of me. And so I felt so fucking horrible about it. Sorry, I didn't know that was going to be like that. I felt, I felt so horrible about it. Damn, that's dark. I felt so horrible about it. I got all the um, cigarette butts, all the everything I could out of our house and threw everything away, right? And I went to my doctor. I told my doctor, man, I quit smoking cigarettes. I don't have no energy. I feel like shit, blah, 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 blah. And he gave me Wellbutrin. And when I got on Wellbutrin, it made me not want to smoke cigarettes even more, okay? And so it was like a miracle, dude. It helped me a lot. And so that's how I quit. I quit smoking cigarettes with Wellbutrin and with the pure want to because I didn't want my son to see me like that. I love your honesty and realness. I appreciate it more than you know. It just lets me know I'm not weird. I'm not the only one. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it's so hard, man. And, and y'all, I have been sober for seven and a half years and I'm still trying to forgive myself. You know, like I just made a video today on TikTok because somebody commented and was like, thank you for, thank you for talking about that. And I literally lost my shit trying to make the video telling them why I make my videos about my addiction and pregnancy. It's not because I'm bragging or I'm proud or anything, you know, it's because you guys have no idea how, when a woman reaches out to me that is pregnant and addicted, like, it's a big deal because they're reaching out to me and they are already feeling like so much shame, you know? 
I had a girl message me today that is pregnant and addicted to meth. And she said, she said, I don't know what happened. I was just flipping through reels and I landed on one of your videos about your story about your son and your pregnancy. And I wanted to reach out to you because I'm on meth and I need to stop, you know, and I was just, it literally, I wish that I had seen somebody like me online or something where I could have reached out to somebody, you know, and I wish that I could have, I wish I would have gotten help. And that's exactly what I told this girl. I said, you got to stop because if you don't, you're going to always wish that you had. And you're always going to feel so guilty and you're going to have so much shame. And it's really hard to ever live it down, you know. And so I would rather people be able to um, get help and not have to carry around the, the burden, you know, that burden of shame for the rest of their lives, you know. But I hope that by me making my videos and sharing about the burden that I carry and the guilt that I feel, I hope by me sharing that, it will help them to understand that they need to get help because they don't want to put their children through this and they don't want to never be able to forgive themselves because one thing about moms is that I can say I forgave myself all I want, but if you're a mom, you know what I'm talking about. You know, when something happens to your child and it's underneath your watch, right, whether it was because of you or because of something you allowed to happen because, you know, whatever, you don't ever let that go, you know, and that's how I feel. And so it, it's really, really hard to share about being addicted and pregnant because people feel very strongly about that topic. And I've even met drug addicts who have cussed me out and shamed me and, and like literally told me that I was a piece of shit, right? Um, and, and I have met regular people who have done the same thing, but you know, it's people feel very, very strongly about it. So I get a polarizing response whenever I talk about it. And it's scary sometimes because people will like threaten my life because of it, you know? So I hope that when I share that, it's, it helps other people. And I know it does. I know it does. Thank you, Rhonda. Because they reach out to me. And that's like the best thing in the whole wide world is to know that, okay, these videos are actually reaching people who they need to be reaching. You know what I mean? And that's what's the nine times out of 10 when a pregnant woman reaches out to me, they will say, I don't know what happened. I was just scrolling through whatever and your reel popped up. And I'm like, it's a sign. God's trying to tell you something, honey. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and it helps me to talk about it, you know? It really does, Devin. It helps me to be able to talk about it and share, you know, about it. Every time I share about it, I feel like I get a little bit more healing, you know? Yes, Judy, I agree. I agree. And, you know, I... When I was when I was using drugs, like there, I wasn't actively in my mind thinking I want to hurt my family, I want to hurt my child, I want to hurt my husband. Like those thoughts never crossed my mind. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, like when you're on substances, it's like a one way street, one way thinking, right? I wasn't thinking about anything else except for my that substance and getting high. You know. And so, and changing the way I felt, I was never thinking about how I wanted to harm other people ever, ever. Um, I'm, I'm not, a, I don't like to hurt people, you know, I don't want to harm anyone. Um, and so it's just sad, you know, it's, it's a sad situation. I remember, and, and this is what's even crazier about it, y'all. I remember looking at people who were pregnant and addicted and thinking, I will never do that. How could they do that to their kid? Oh my God. And then it happened to me. And then I became that person who I said I would never become. And that's what I really want people to understand is that all those years that I said that I would never do this, I would never shoot up. I would never smoke crack. I would never, um, have sex 
with 75 million people at the same time, whatever, you know, I would never, um, you know, use drugs while I was having my kids around or pregnant. It, everything that I ever said that I wouldn't do became something that I did, you know? And so that's what I also hope that people get from me speak, talking about stuff, you know, because I try to talk about things like on here with you guys where it's like entertaining, but also like, I hope that there's some kind of message that is coming through at the end. You know, I really do hope that. Now, sometimes I'm just on here wilding out and we're just talking shit and laughing and kicking in with the girls. But most of the time I have a, I have a message that I'm trying to convey. I don't know if it gets, I don't know if people get, it's getting delivered, but I do try to um, round things out with positive, on a positive note, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the judgment, for, judgment is what keeps us um, in the closet and keeps us sick. And that's the stigma of addiction. You know, um, many people are struggling with addiction in some form or another. I mean, your most holier than thou people are addicted to fucking caffeine and have to have it every single morning. And if they don't, they can't function. You know what I mean? And it's just to what degree, you know? Do you still do those anonymous confessions? Yeah, Renee, if anybody wants to send me those in, the um, the, the secrets keep you sick. Yeah, if you want to send one in, just send it in to me, and I will post it anonymously. Absolutely. I, I, I need to make a post for that and let people know that I'm doing it still. I always still do everything, you know? But that was, I started this thing on my TikTok two years ago where I, it was called Secrets Keep You Sick, and I would take anonymous uh, confessions from people that they had never told anyone, right? Uh, and they didn't feel comfortable, you know, like saying and people knowing it was them. So I would say it and I would share about it online for them. And, you know, so that way they could get it off their chest. And that's fun. I have gotten some really, really sad ones and I've got some really funny ones. I got some really crazy ones. And so I love doing, I love doing interactive stuff with people, with a group, with my, my audience, because that's fun to me, you know, I, and I really like having people on to come share their stories. I feel like what I've been doing the last like week or so is like kind of getting to know everybody on my Facebook page, because I just feel like it kind of like got really, I feel like it grew substantially in the last like month. And so what I've been trying to do is like go live and like talk to people and tell them a little bit about myself and like share a little bit about my story and then, talk, you know, that kind of thing. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do, and that's what I was posting about on my page today was what I'm hoping to do is I want to start doing like a once a week live, right? Where we talk about something that's going to help us in our sobriety. You make a lot of sense and you help people to understand not to be ashamed of asking for help. And that's for people degrading an addict. But if you told them you had cancer, they would pity you and want to help you. Somebody asked me today, they said, you've been on Suboxone for six years. And I said, seven and a half. But, and they said, why? And I said, would you ask somebody that was taking heart medication why they were taking their heart medication? Would you ask a woman who was struggling with obesity why she was taking her um, medication to help her lose weight? Would you ask somebody who is taking their mental health medication why they're taking their mental health medication? I think it's because I think people assume that I'm getting high on my medication. And y'all, that's the farthest thing from the truth with um, Suboxone, at least uh, for me. You know, um, I take it every day as prescribed, so I don't feel any kind of feeling from it. Now, I have told you guys, like, there are ways to divert your medication and work your way around the system, but I just don't want to do that. I'm not trying to get, be fucked up. I want to be a sound, present parent, you know, and I'm able to do that today. Um, so, I really appreciate that, Rhonda. I really do. Um, Y'all are just so sweet to me. I have been like in my, I'm, I'm very emotional lately. Um, I have been super emotional this week because I have been seeing all y'all's comments and I've been getting all y'all's messages. And then I post a video, a, 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 a status or something and you guys are all on the status. It's just very, very, very crazy to me because 
Um, my Facebook has always been like 20 people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so this, this, the reels have really, um, made it to where on Facebook you can just meet all kinds of different people. And I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. Yes, it is that time of the year. You know, usually during the holidays, um, when I was in active addiction, um, I would get, I would get really depressed. And so I would just use and use and use and use because I felt so ashamed to go around my family, you know, I, and I, and I went around them, but I would go around them all fucked up. And I knew in my heart of hearts that this was not what I needed to be doing, you know, but I would still do it. And I'm so grateful that my mom and dad never like just told me to never come back. You know what I mean? Now, sure. They ran away from Arkansas for a little while because they needed a break, you know, from me and my sister, but now they're back. They moved back when I got sober. When me and my sister Michelle got sober, my parents moved back to Arkansas from New York. So, and now we're all sober. <sighs> Whew. But anyway, I see, like, I don't even know what we really talked about, but I feel like I talked about some pretty good stuff tonight. <laughs> You know, I feel like I got to tell you guys about cross addiction and I got to tell you guys about what I struggled with in early recovery and I got to talk to you guys about pregnancy and addiction and I got to talk to you guys about shoplifting, you know, like that's how, this is how my lives are. Okay. And so if you guys ever are like, I want to come in and I want to talk, I want to talk about something, you know, if you want me to talk about something, message me or make sure you put it in the comments. Like, Nicole, will you please discuss this? Will you please discuss this? Because what I do is I come on here and then you guys prompt me, right? Through your comments and stuff. And then as you guys prompt me, I just start going. And I have to, I want to show you all this. So i would never tried this brand before. It's called Lila B. I, I guess they're going out of, uh, business now, which is a shame. This literally is like, it's heavy as fuck. It feels like a rock. But look at this. Oh, look at this. Look at this packaging, you guys. Hold on. Jesus, Joseph and Mary. Hold on. I want y'all to see this. Oh my God, this pissed me off. Put y'all down there. Okay. Isn't that cool? I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's like a cheek. If you put it on your cheeks or your lips. And so, isn't that cool? My favorite dish for Thanksgiving. Um, let me see. I love stuffing from inside the bird. Okay. I have to, I like it inside the bird. My mom makes it really good. And then I like... Um, my, um, my mother-in-law makes this corn casserole stuff where she puts corn and cream cheese and all this other stuff inside of like Jiffy cornbread and it's sweet. Oh my God. It tastes so good. So isn't that cute? I want to buy a whole bunch of the, the packages and just scrape the stuff out of there and put my own makeup in there. But it's like super heavy, you guys. Like seriously. But um, what is y'all's favorite dishes? Oh, is that what it's called? It's called corn pudding. Oh wait, it's good. I like it. I love um, my. I like cornbread to be sweet. You know what I'm saying? So like, if I make cornbread, I'm putting sugar in my cornbread, honey. Hey, Shannon. Thank you, baby. You didn't have to do that. Thank you for the stars. Thank y'all are so amazing. Like I. Facebook just gave me the stars thingy majigger, you know? Ooh, I like sweet potatoes, too. And I am demonetized on Facebook because they don't, they, if you make videos that are too, like, real, then you'll get demonetized here on Facebook. Well, y'all already know, I'm too real for Facebook, and they demonetized my ass, like, six months ago. <laughs> so I don't make money off my reels at all. And so they just gave me the capabilities to use stars. I didn't think they would ever give it to me because of the fact that I'm demonetized. But anyways, I appreciate it. And like I said, what we're going to do is um, at the end of the 90-day period. So we just started a new 90-day period. So what's this month? 
yeah. December, January. So in February, I'm going to go into my stars and count them all up. And whatever the amount is, we'll do a giveaway. So I can give it back to you guys. So that'll be cool. You know what I mean? And that way, I don't got to pull it out of my own pocket. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because what I was doing before was the last giveaway I did was two people got $25 and then the giveaway before that I did 50 and then the giveaway before that I did 100 You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to go bankrupt <laughs> trying to, to give away money to people. <laughs> so anyway, I really have fun going live with you guys. I really, really enjoy it. Like I just, I get so much out of it. I have such a good time. And uh, it really just gets me excited about staying sober, and it helps me stay sober. And um, I think one of you guys asked me if I'm still involved in 12 Steps. And so, uh, unfortunately, I'm not. And, and it's not because I don't support. It's not because I don't believe in the 12 Steps. I believe in the 12 Steps. I love the 12 Steps. It's the, it's the people in the program that have turned me away from the 12-step programs. And it's just the judgment. And so I would rather be around people that are more open-minded and more accepting of people in the different pathways that they choose to take. So I joined MARA, which is Medication Assisted Recovery Anonymous. And they support harm reduction and they support all pathways to recovery. And it's, they are just amazing. And their code is non-judgment is their code. And so that's what I do now. But I still do my um, journaling. I still do my therapy. I still apply the 12 steps in my life almost on a daily basis. Um, like I try to do the next right thing. Like I'm not perfect, you know. There's times where I will go off on somebody on, on my videos, you know. Because I'm just a human being and I have feelings, you know, but I try really hard to be a good person to everybody. I try to help everybody and I really, really put myself out there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to access, you know. Oh, thanks, Tiffany. I appreciate that, girl. I'm trying. I'm losing weight, girl. I'm working really hard on not eating <laughs> because before I was just shoving food in my face all the time. Um, but I work really, really hard to like make myself available to people to help them. And that ends up helping me in the long run. So I love you guys. I'll be on here tomorrow night too, if you want to hang out. So I'll come on about 645, 650 and we'll go for about an hour. Okay. All right, you guys. Good night, y'all.